Good morning, people, audience in the room. Hello. Yeah. Good, Good morning, morning. Audience, audience in the room, room. and audience, audience online. online. This is the second, second lecture in this series that I want to talk about mitigation and adaptation. And yesterday I showed you this slide about uh, how I understand the, the literature about transport and adaptation and mitigation to look like, sort of uh, very much skewed towards mitigation, and I explained why, which is very much because of the tremendous growth in uh, emissions that we've seen on the global scale with growth across all sectors, but particularly in road vehicles and aviation. Actually, today, I want to talk more about adaptation than about mitigation, though I will come back to mitigation at some point. And as I understand it, there's, there's four issues with regards to adaptation in relation to climate. I think, first of all, adaptation remains underappreciated in transport policy in most countries and in most cities. That's not to say that there is no attention, but it doesn't get as much attention as mitigation. It's also often seen as separate from mitigation. And typically, adaptation is seen as something that can be fixed by improving physical infrastructure and engineering. So there is very little attention being paid to the social and political dimensions of adaptation. And finally, often adaptation is seen in terms of futures that are very close to the current status quo or maybe some, some change, but there is little room for thinking about drastically different futures when we, uh, when we think about adaptation. And this diagram here offers a fairly common framing. Of course, my point is not to single out or criticize particular authors, but I think what these authors have done, they've summarized the, the common thinking quite well, in the sense that climate change is seen as a range of biophysical hazards that have an impact on transport, which then causes various consequences. And action intervention is first of all about re trying to reduce the impacts, by reducing the sensitivity and the vulnerability of transport systems. And on the other hand, action is about reducing the consequences, which is basically about enhancing resilience and adaptive capacity of, in transport systems. And what this figure tries to capture is where I think we should be going with the literature that sort of these mitigation and adaptation both need to be given about equal attention and really need to be sort of merged, that we think about mitigation and adaptation as, uh, as entwined, as intricately linked. Looking a little bit further on, uh, to the literature on adaptation and transport, then it's probably a little bit more diverse than you might be thinking on the basis of my characterization so far. Now, I don't have time to offer a full review of that literature, so I will restrict myself to four observations. One point is that the literature is strongly rooted in particular disciplinary traditions. So there's a strong influence from thinking in engineering, in network science, disaster management, and some contributions from ecology. And the main concerns are, are as I already uh, suggested, about vulnerability to disruption, and adaptive capacity and resilience. At the level of transport networks as a whole, specific nodes and links, think about, for instance, particular stations or particular junctions, particular roads. There is also a strand of work that looks at the behavioral side, sort of how individuals respond to and anticipate various forms of uh, climate disruption. I would also say that the literature tends to be aligned with a certain politics that it typically is not aware of. So this is sort of is an unintentional uh, alignment, you could say. 
There's, on the one hand, the politics of intervention, because this literature is very much focused on coping with disruption, much less so with understanding the nature and the causes of vulnerability. Those are typically placed in the biophysical realm, outside of society, somewhere in nature. There's another politics, which after Anne-Marie Moll, the, the, the Dutch philosopher, um, I, would, I would call ontological politics, which I use here to denote the privileging of certain understandings of how the world or reality is over others. And this ontological politics sort of has two components. On the one hand, this, this frame of nature versus society, climatic events as biophysical hazards somewhere outside of the transport system. And the other ontological framing is about disruption versus normalcy. We've got a transport, an urban system that is characterized by one or more equilibria, and this disruption sort of moves these transport systems out of that equilibrium uh, temporarily or for a, for a longer time. Now, this kind of framing is, is, is quite captured quite well by this diagram, which I took from a paper by Wen and colleagues published in, in Transport Reviews a couple of years, which I actually think is a really good paper where all the terms in the figure are quite carefully defined and um, a really nice contribution to this particular literature. And this diagram for me illustrates some of the point I was just making. So we can see a clear politics of intervention here because the diagram sensitizes us towards coping and managing uh, disruption following an unexpected event. It tells us nothing about the causes of vulnerability. Vulnerability is rather understood as the extent of reduction in the performance of the system. Now, with regards to ontological politics, there's, this is a clear example of thinking in terms of a single equilibrium. So, this diagram is very much about what in the literature is sometimes called bounce backability. And it, this diagram clearly reproduces the thinking in terms of normalcy versus disruption. This point I was making about nature versus society, you can't really get from this figure, and that's partly because of the very abstract nature of this uh, representation. But there are other representations where you see this very clearly. This is a diagram from, an, from another paper, was published a couple of years ago in Transport Policy, and I really like this diagram. It's a little bit complex, but if you follow all the lines, you can see that these authors have thought very carefully about how disruptions promulgate across different networks. So if you start with the, with the orange boxes, those are the stresses, sort of change in precipitation in this case, which has a number of different consequences on the land use uh, uh, system, the transport system, the electricity system. So you see how these events cascade across these multiple networks. And this diagram clearly captures that nature versus society framing I was talking about earlier. If we look further at the literature, we can say that there are two ways of understanding resilience. And I summarize them as, on the one hand, engineering resilience, and on the other hand, socio-ecological resilience. Engineering resilience is really about a, transport's, a transport system's ability to resist and absorb the impact of a disturbance, maintain an acceptable level of service, recover, or transform to a different stage of, oper uh, of operation. And this is from a paper that was published, I think, in Journal of Transport Geography last year. And again, it's a really nice paper that offers a really comprehensive uh, um, description and, and explanation of this approach. The other approach is based in slightly different understanding and is really about resilience as a transport system's ability to adapt, con continuous adaptation to change. And there are two versions of that ability to adapt. On the one hand, you've got flexibility. On the other hand, you've got agility. 
Flexibility is about the ability to reconfigure the system in light of expected changes. If you can predict things, this is how you can adapt to this. But with climate change, there will be things that we will fail to predict. Think about the, the, the very heavy rainfall last year that caused mayhem across parts of eastern Belgium, uh, um, Germany, the south of the Netherlands. Uh, failure of failure to, to, to predict. So, so here you need to be able to adapt and evolve in environments of continuous and unanticipated change. So agility is just as important as flexibility. Now these two approaches to resilience have quite different academic backgrounds. The engineering resilience paradigm sort of is very much about privileging stability where disruption is seen as a form of failure. And the world is seen as complicated. It can be known, we think, in terms of probabilities. Social ecological resilience is about change, where disruption is seen as much more positive, as something that leads to renewal that is internal and automatic. So it's an opportunity for change. The world here is seen as complex and essentially unpredictable. So we think in terms of possibility rather than try to put a, a number, a probability on it. The type of learning is different in both systems, as are the kinds of institutions and the kinds of interventions that are associated with them. So with engineering resilience, it's very much about minimizing or even avoiding change over time and focusing on particular components or assets within your networks. Whereas with social ecological resilience, it's much more about cultivating evolution, ongoing change in your whole system by focusing on compatibility, connectivity, and the modularity of your parts. Some examples of social ecological resilience then. Um, on the left hand side is a picture about modular lanes enabled by digital technologies where you can sort of adapt and change the way particular lanes are used depending on the time of day, the day of the week, the um, season, or in case there is an unforeseen uh, uh, level of congestion and busyness on your network. So you can use these technologies to constantly adjust the way uh, your, your, your network works. Another example is on the right hand side. This is a slightly futuristic design for an autonomous bus system with little pots that are driving around and, uh, and sort of help to satisfy the demand from users. I should say that this is only one design. I could have chosen others. This happens to be done by a company based in, in Sing Singapore, but it kind of captures really that, that notion of modularity and, and flexibility to, uh, to constantly adjust how you provide your public transport services. So for many of these systems, the concept is not only about different hardware, the different equipment, the different vehicles. It's also about different institutions in the form of the abolishment of timetables, fixed lines, uh, for instance, so that you enhance the flexibility and agility of your system, which becomes much more, much more modular and, and connected. Somewhat ironically, the flexibility and agility of these systems can also be found in the existing minibus taxi systems, often deemed informal, that we see across large parts of the global south. For instance, in South Africa, we have these, these buses. Um, and the irony is that policymakers actually want to get rid of these kinds of systems for various reasons that are completely understandable, but they want to often replace them by bus rapid transit systems, which lack that modularity, the connectivity, the, the flexibility, and, and, and sort of make a system much more rigid. And well, you can ask questions about uh, how, how sensible that approach is in 
a future where climate change will be much more important than it is now. Within this social ecological paradigm uh, with regards to uh, resilience, there's also a lot of emphasis on bi biomimicry, where the idea is essentially that you try to identify and abstract a design approach on the basis of ecosystems that have evolved over many billion years. And there is a famous study that was published in, in 2010 where they made a comparison between the Tokyo metro system and a particular, um, a particular slime mold and they sort of they manipulated the actions of the organism with the help of light so that it, it was able to, uh, to, 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 to grow in those, uh, in, in those areas where uh, sort of, which actually the valleys within uh, the, the topography of the Tokyo landscape. And as you can see, the two diagrams are similar. They're not identical, but there is a clear overlap between them. That paper, this paper actually got a lot of attention at the time, and it was, for instance, in the UK, uh, also written about in, in the popular media. This is another example of where a, a group of designers have deconstructed the conventional car and have reconstructed it into a quite different vehicle, but based on biomimicry, sort of using these these uh, uh, principles from ecology and create a vehicle that, that looks really different to what we're used to today, but in sort of in line with these, uh, uh, these rules and uh, somewhat aesthetically pleasing, of course, that is some, always a, a, a cause for debate, but you can see sort of this, uh, this approach. So there's a lot going on in this area, much of which sit out, sits outside of conventional transport studies, but particularly in design, also in urban design, this is really a, 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 an area of, of huge activity. I think there's much to be said in favor of both approaches to resilience that I introduced, but I think they also have some limitations. And I think what we see here is that there is, it's very much focused on the supply, on the provision of transport services. There's very little attention being paid to questions of people's mobility, people's needs, capabilities, inequalities, and so on. There's also very little attention paid to the politics that are embedded in infrastructure and uh, transport technology. And as a result of all of this, we see very little attention being paid to justice. So the major risk here is that transport resilience and adaptation gets depoliticized. And the politics of transport are getting marginalized. And with politics, I'm referring here to the choices that are made in the processes of intervening and designing and the privileging of certain interests and concerns over others. The question then is, of course, does this matter? Is depolitization of resilience and adaptation in the transport context a problem? And I think there are some reasons to, to say yes to that question. This is a, from a study I've done with a colleague in Oxford, Anna Pusteva, um, and we've been doing work in Manila for a number of years. What you see on the left-hand side is a map of the study area in, in sort of central Manila, um, where if you look at the dotted lines in the K4 barangays, BRG, why it stands for barangay is the lowest level of local government in the Filipino system. And these four areas were selected because they are largely uh, sort of low income, semi formal areas of the kinds of streets that you see on, on, in, in the picture. So, semi legal, high density, low income, very prone to flooding in many cases. And not just the areas themselves, but also the main routes sort of that, uh, that, that connect them. So for instance, Quirino Avenue, you see there is, is very vulnerable to flooding. 
especially during the, the rainy season, the monsoon period. And here, this is a quote from an interview that we did uh, with um, a, a local expert uh, who, who tried to explain to us his understanding of why these roads were flooding so often. Because initially, partially informed by the popular media representations about the Philippines, I thought that the flooding would mostly be related to questions of climate change and climate change related changes in precipitation. But the floods were much more common than tropical storms and had a wide array of different causes, including the drainage, the drainage system. Because of the growth in population, there's increasing pressure on a very old drainage system, which in some cases goes back many decades. Um, and was actually at capacity. And uh, what happened, according to this local expert, was that a, a local politician who sits in the national parliament, the Congress, wanted to uh, do his constituents a favor, so wanted to build a new drainage system, which was basically a, a big pipe, a concrete pipe. We saw them lying when we were there, going through the neighborhoods but actually caused a lot of new problems. It made the flooding worse in particular areas, particularly in the residential areas where the low-income people were living. Because what the point of his intervention was to, to, to make the major roads like Quirino Avenue less prone to flooding. Because these roads were used by middle-class people driving cars who are much more likely to vote. So you can see that there is a clear politics to this kind of intervention and to thinking about adaptation and, uh, and the consequences that has for daily life and also for local transport. And actually, in our study, it turned out that the situation was even more complex with regards to these floods. For when we spoke to the residents of these local areas, it was quite clear that for them it was all about garbage. Garbage clogged up the drainage infrastructure. This created flooding of streets, which helped to enhance road congestion, which led the local government to have garbage collected at, in the middle of the night at 3 a.m. So people were supposed to come to the collection points. A bell was ringing. People were to, supposed to come to the collection points at 3 a.m. in the middle of the night in a context where people work long hours, have arduous commutes, so are really exhausted. So you can imagine very few people actually deliver their garbage at the point in time when collection was due to, be, uh, due to take place. So what do they do? They deliver it earlier and leave it there. Where the garbage then gets sorted and picked by waste pickers, sort of the poorest of the poor who use this as an opportunity to sort of extract items of value which they can then sell on and, and earn a little income from. So you can see this garbage becomes quite messy and yeah, this helped to enhance uh, sort of, it, it sort of ended up in the drainage system partly because of this. So we see quite a complex situation where population growth, drainage networks, questions of poverty, questions of finance, because the areas that we were doing our research were among the poorest in the city. They have the lowest tax base, so they can't afford to get a private garbage service that comes and collects the, the garbage during the day. So you see all these factors sort of working together. So the causes of flooding and vulnerability lie primarily in social, economic and political processes, not so much in the changes to nat natural hazards. Now, this is quite a specific example, but I think it's quite a telling example because I think similar things will hold in other consequences as well. Climate change is not simply about biophysical change, it's very much about how the biophysical interacts and intersects with the social, the economic, and the political. Which 
leads, led me to conclude some time ago that I think we need to understand adaptation and resilience in, in different ways. And some time ago, in a piece that was published in the Journal of Transport Geography, I began to elaborate an alternative approach. And here you kind of see an a, a updated version of what, what I wrote in that paper. And I basically propose we think of adaptation as consisting of three components, three elements, if you like. Preparedness for open futures, resilience, and justice. So preparedness for an open future kind of goes back to something I showed yesterday. This slide's about Gaia in the work of uh, Isabel Stengers. We, we are no longer authorized to forget this sort of, this, 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 this ticklish assemblage of, of forces that she calls Gaia. It also means that action, which usually is already future-oriented, but needs to become even more explicitly future-oriented and consider what in philosophy is called ontic uncertainty in the environment. Ontic uncertainty is environment, is, is you, you could say, randomness, inherent unpredictability in the world that you're looking at. And it's different from epistemic uncertainty. Epistemic uncertainty is uncertainty on the part of the analyst where you as an observer lack the knowledge about what's going to happen. This is a slightly different form of uncertainty where we're basically saying the world is inherently uncertain and there are very strict limits to what we can actually know. We will never be able to fully understand what is going to happen despite, the, despite all the efforts of the world we do in terms of increasing our knowledge base. Adaptation is also about resilience, which I understand as the capacity of an entity to endure in that environment that it is part of. And it does that through ongoing changes to itself. So it introduces novelty to match the novelty in the environment. It adapts because the environment is adapting. And through that also changes that environment. So you could say, and this is something that, that people like Isabel Stengers are also writing about, that there is a, a mutual infection of, with, where, where one infects the other. So constant, ongoing change. And this kind of work goes, is very much influenced by uh, the, the gentleman shown here, uh, Alfred North Whitehead, who happens to be Isabel Stengers, uh, uh, favorite philosopher. She's written a wonderful book about him. And, and he's really known for thinking about processes and about reality as a process. So his thinking is quite influential in, in how Stengers has been thinking about this and also how I think about this, uh, the, these issues. And this constant adaptation of entity and environment raises questions about how can we introduce novelty in a world without robbing other entities in that world of their ability to grow, to live well now and in the future. And this is where the question of justice comes in. Because for me in this context, justice is really about doing this in a responsible way. The easiest way to think about this is to come up with a set of generic rules, a moral code, if you like. And you can do that in a way that brings adaptation and mitigation together in the way that I spoke about at the start. So you minimize the imposition of change on the capability to enjoy self-enjoyment of other entities that make up the world now and in the future. Now, this sounds quite abstract, but what it means in the transport context, or what it could mean in the transport context, is that you say, well, our rule would be we make walking and then cycling the default of our transport system. We say that's the best you can do where it's sensible. If you can't do that, you move to collective modes of transport. And you avoid high carbon, long distance travel, wherever that is feasible. 
And I think on the one hand, it makes sense to work with these kinds of generic moral codes for behavior. On the other hand, there are always problems with generic codes and generic rules. And I think we should really move, we should refrain from blanket application of these kinds of rules and think about what is appropriate in a particular context. Because the creation of generic rules will disadvantage people, particularly those who are already vulnerable. And this is why we need to think about capabilities and the risk of oppression and domination. And this brings us back to two of the authors I spoke about yesterday, Amartya Sen and Iris Marion Young. I'll talk more about Amartya Sen in the next set of lectures, but he's, uh, he, he won the Nobel Prize uh, in economics for his work on, on capabilities as an alternative way of thinking about development. And for him, capabilities are about the real opportunities people have to achieve functionings, that is, activities and states of being that those people value. So they know best what is good for them, what they want to do, and development is about accommodating uh, and, and nurturing the ability to, to achieve those activities and, and states of, of being. It's a very powerful framework, it's being increasingly used in transport studies, but often in a very individual way. So we think about your capability to do something, but we don't then think about, okay, if your capability to do X gets increased, what are the opportunities for others around you and further away in space and time? and their capabilities. And a classic example is, it would be good if we could give everyone a car, in many ways, because it's convenient, comfortable, safe, and so on and so forth. But of course, that's creating problems for others. So we need to think about these capabilities as interconnected across space and time. And when we do that, we also need to think about what Iris, Mary, and Young uh, calls oppression and domination, which are institutional constraints on people's self-development and self-determination, respectively. And there are many examples in the historical development of mobility systems of these processes of oppression and, and domination. And I mentioned some yesterday when I talked about the racism embedded, embedded in some historical interventions in transport systems, but we can think about others. When we think about capabilities, uh, what you see on the left-hand side is a, a, a representation of what is supposed to be an electric pickup truck. Now, SUVs and pickup trucks are among the most rapid-growing segments of the vehicle market, particularly in urban traffic. And I've written elsewhere about, about how I think SUVs in particular are a rather selfish form of transport because they externalize risks onto the environment. And that's also how they are being framed, how they're being sold to consumers, for instance. You as a driver, as a passenger, are safe, comfortable, you sit high, you have lots of space. But because of the vehicle, the, the, the size, the weight, the form, you are making traffic more, different, more challenging for pedestrians, cyclists, other groups on the, on the road. So that's why you're sort of externalizing the risk. So this is a form of transport that infects its environment in quite significant ways. And they also entrench a particular type of provision because the weight and the power that is required means that larger batteries are required, which does impose more constraints on the environment, on people, and on capabilities for mobility in the immediate surrounding, but also, for instance, in the areas where the mining of lithium, nickel, and cobalt takes place. And there's quite a bit of research now going on about how the surge in electric vehicles will have very significant implications for, uh, for mining activities, resource extractivism in, in quite new locations. Portugal is, is a clear example in the, in the European context. And uh, I think we saw 
quite substantial protests in, in uh, Serbia a couple of months ago, where the government has now decided against allowing mining for lithium. But it's yet to be seen whether that is a definitive no or whether it's more a temporary no, and at some point they will, uh, they will agree. So this question about capabilities is quite a complex one, and we need, um, I will talk about it in more detail in other lectures as well. The picture bottom right is Los Angeles, and it is York Boulevard in North California, which is an area, part, it's a very long road actually, but, but parts of it, neighborhoods along it, are seeing significant gentrification. And the interesting thing is, is that the provision of infrastructure for cycling, as you can see here, is put in by developers. Developers who actually are quite supportive of people cycling because it means they do not have to allocate as much space to parking provision, which means you can create more housing units, which means you can, create, you can extract more value, you can create more income. So what we see here is in, in, in Los Angeles is that the development of cycling infrastructure, which in, in theory could be a more equitable form of transport, actually is linked to what Iris Marion Young calls constraints on self-development, because this type of infrastructure is not being built in neighborhoods where people live who really suffer from transport disadvantage. It comes to the benefit of groups in the city who are already quite privileged. So quite complex relationships and I think we should really refrain from thinking about cycling and walking as inherently good, inherently low carbon, inherently just forms of transport. It really depends on the context that we're in. And there are other examples of this. There's now a large literature on whether transit development, public transport development, transit-oriented development, TOD, is inducing gentrification or not. And I took this figure, did this figure from a paper that was published recently in the Annals of the AAG, which is by a group of researchers who've been long looking at the gentrification consequences of TOD, and they've come up with this uh, this model that they show here, where they say in the first stages of transit-oriented development, you do see gentrification occur, but at some point that effect sort of uh, diminishes and actually uh, goes down again. And they've, they've tested this in, in various Asian cities, um, Taipei, and I think in this paper they look at Tokyo, and they, they, they find evidence that uh, supports this, um, this thesis of, yes, TOD does induce gentrification. So we really need to think again about justice in this context. And it means that TOD is not necessarily a just adaptation strategy either. And it gets a little bit more complex, particularly when we think about adaptation and mitigation in connection with one another, because transit-oriented development means higher density development, means greater risk of the creation of urban heath islands. Urban heath islands are a, a problem, particularly in warm, hot climates and with temperatures going up, particularly during summers, in, in a more climate, in, in, a, in a more unstable climate, can, can become a bigger problem than they already are. Now, there is very little research on the connection between transport and urban heat islands. There's a few studies that have suggested that a, a very auto-oriented development can increase heat island effects because you've got asphalt which absorbs a lot of the heat but there are also some studies that have suggested that TOD can also increase heat islands. There's a work in Brisbane, Australia by Kam Kamruzaman and colleagues also published in the Journal of Transport uh, 
geography that does suggest that there are some urban heat island effects uh, linked to TOD. So where this gets us to is that there are unfortunately no simple solutions when we think about adaptation in conjunction with mitigation in conjunction with justice. In many places, depending on climatic co conditions, TOD as an adaptation plus mitigation strategy is not necessarily without problems and can diminish capabilities of some people in some situations. Now, this statement is necessarily vague because I don't have any empirical evidence to back this up with. I think this is really an area where much more research is needed. But I think it is likely that people who are in some ways already vulnerable, for instance because of old age or because of poor health, will suffer the most from these kinds of urban heath island effects. And if income also intersects with uh, health and old age, then I think you can see that sort of the situation becomes quite messy. So perhaps it's a little bit unsatisfactory for me to say that there are no simple solutions, but I think it really means we need to think more carefully about the connections between these different processes, and we really need more empirical research being done on this. So if you want to write another dissertation, then this is one area where I think you can, can make some really interesting contributions. I want to leave it at this for now, but we'll pick up some of these lines that I've thrown out this morning in subsequent lectures and return to some of the ideas and concepts that I've floated this morning. For now, I want to finish with three fairly simple takeaway messages, very much like yesterday. On the one hand, yes, adaptation needs to be center stage, and it needs to be done in ways that integrate it with mitigation and really make the social sciences as central to this agenda, because I think that's really been lacking. I think it's really important that engineers are heavily involved in this, but I hope to have made clear that there are social, political, and economic dimensions to this, and that's where social scientists can make a powerful contribution. I also think that adaptation needs to be reimagined quite radically in some ways, beyond prevailing perspectives on resilience and thinking that marginalizes context specificity and questions of justice. And I think these reconceptualizations really need to be accompanied by empirical research to trace what differences they make. Thank you very much. We do have time for questions, if there are any. to link adaptation to mitigation. Because all these stakeholders have managed to come up with quite radical imaginations of how the future might look like for low carbon. And we have a lot of experience there. Sort of, I think what is really missing in that is sort of linking that also to questions of adaptation. Because what may be good from a low carbon perspective may not necessarily be good from an adaptation perspective. That's why I wanted to end with the TOD example, which in many ways is, is one of the best things you can do from a, from a low carbon point of view. But from an adaptation point of view, it brings with it a number of things. So it is, it's again trying to think outside of our boxes, outside of our silos that we are accustomed to, and, and think laterally across these various dimensions. And I think for adaptation, the, the, the issue is really by, by fully linking it to mitigation.
Good. Thank you. We continue in 10 minutes. Yes.
Right, it's 11 o'clock. <laughs> I suggest we continue with the third lecture in the series on knowledge and valuation. And yesterday, I showed you this slide. I displayed it, but didn't talk much about the contents of it, and that's what I want to do today. I want to sort of challenge the importance of, of the statements shown here about the importance of cost-benefit cost calculus, about travel time as a disutility, something that we would rather want to avoid at all costs, the importance of fast, reliable, and efficient transport, and about the centrality of technology, getting the prices right, and infrastructure provision to enacting change in transport systems, including the reduction of greenhouse gas emissions. And I said yesterday, these claims are not wrong. They have an absolute uh, truth to them, but, they are just only one way of thinking about transport systems and the choices made within those and the way we can change them. So today I want to think a little bit more about why we ended up with this way of thinking about transport. And I want to make a plea for further pluralization of transport knowledge and identify valuation the way we value different transport systems, different ways of moving through space as a key site for creating that plural, pluralization. So let's start with the first point. If we want to understand changes in transport knowledge, I think we need to adopt both an internal focus and an external focus. An internal focus means that we need to understand science as a practice and, a, uh, and, an and, and we need to think about epistemic cultures. Epistemic cultures is a term from uh, science and technology studies, uh, Nor Satina in particular, who has argued that an epistemic culture is a specific arrangement that makes knowledge construction possible, ensures that it has distinct technical, social, and symbolic dimensions, and that it can exist and evolve within and across disciplinary boundaries. But in addition to this focus on science as a practice and as an epistemic culture, we also need to think about its external relations, its relationships with wider society with discourses that condition what can be said and known and that shape the re relationships among actors, um, like I explained yesterday. So these discourses are really the, the, the link between what happens within science and wider society. And I want to start with these external relations first. Um, I would say that prevailing knowledge about transport has been shaped by multiple processes. This is going to be very, very broad brush, very brief. I just want to point out some, some highlights. I explained yesterday that the way we think about transport is very starkly influenced by the expansion of automobility in the global north from the early 20th century onwards with a focus on the facilitation of growth for economic and also geopolitical reasons. Uh, it's what the story of the autobahns in Germany is very well known. But also if we think about the interstate network in the US, one of the drivers for the creation of that network was actually for the military to be able to move troops quickly from one side of the, of the continent to the other. So geopolitics have always been very, very significant to uh, the, the, the growth of automobility. Questions of efficiency have always been important. From the very start, it's been important to create networks for that, that maximize connectivity, uh, sorry, that, that maximize accessibility at minimum cost. So you try to create networks like hub and spoke 
structures that are very efficient um, and relatively cheap to, to provide. And I also talked about how changes have been tackled through provision and the predict and provide paradigm is, is a very good example of that, that we try to predict what the future demand for transport is, which is always assumed to grow, and then uh, we provide accordingly. And where problems emerged, we've tried to solve them through technology. And there are some very good examples also of relatively low tech solutions to problems. Safety, road safety issues, for instance, and, and traffic injury have been uh, reduced significantly through the mandatory use of, of seat belts. It's one of the, one of the big success stories of, of intervening successfully in, uh, in automobility. So that's one set of processes that's been very influential. Just as influential has been the, the rise of neoliberalism since the 1970s onwards. And in transport studies, it has led to a broader focus. Previously, the focus was predominantly on vehicular movements, but from the 1970s onwards, the focus became much more on individuals as the actors who make choices. And individuals became understood in very much the way neoliberalism does, as sovereign actors who make choices about trips and activities that maximize their utility, that maximize their satisfaction. Now, some of that work has recognized that we have constraints and that these choices are not uh, completely individual. There are relationships with households, social networks, and, and so, forth, so forth. But the idea of the individual as the sovereign actor is very deeply anchored in, in how we understand transport. Neoliberalism also has legitimized experimentation with the efficacy of a wider range of interventions in transport systems. So not only more an infrastructure or more better technology, but also think about pricing, think about information provision, think about marketing, think about nudges, the latest range of neoliberalism uh, sort of the whole, uh, yeah, the, the, the Thaler and Sunstein work on, on nudging has been very influential in transport as well. The third set of processes is around the rise of sustainability and a particular understanding of sustainability, which is known as ecological modernization. This is, you could say, the ecological version of neoliberalism, in which economic growth and ecological problems are seen as reconcilable. And climate change provides opportunities for innovation and the reinvention of economic relations. So environmental issues, including greenhouse gas emissions, are recoded in economic terms to be solved by better markets, better market performance, and technological change. So things like pricing measures, carbon trading, and so on, follow from this kind of approach. So in transport, both in research and particularly also in policy professional discourse, we see a lot of win-win talk, where it is, if we make transport more sustainable, we will solve air pollution, we will reduce greenhouse gas emissions, we will reduce noise pollution, and we will reduce congestion and contribute to economic growth. So this win-win this thinking is very, very starkly embedded in how we think about transport. The focus on technology has been solidified, and again, there are certain success stories. The catalytic converter of the 1980s is a very good example of that. The, the whole discourse about acid rain kind of disappeared in, in the space of a decade or so, and, and the, the uptake of catalytic converters has been essential to that. And yesterday I spoke about the uh, avoid, shift, improve framework that also fits within this way of thinking about sustainability. The fourth set of relations or processes and events sort of is really about questions of changes in the wider world and the geography of the wider world. So we can think about the rise of development, sort of done by the north 
in the global south for the most part. We can think about the enduring structures that emerged during colonialism after decolonization, where there are still many dependencies. The Netherlands, for instance, still has very strong relationships with Suriname, the Antilles, what other countries. You see the same in the UK, you see the same in France, you see the same in Belgium, for instance. So these relationships often endure in much more informal structures which have been very influential and have made, have made the circulation of knowledges developed in Western Europe uh, across the world possible, or at least has been that circulation of knowledge has been, has been uh, facilitated by these enduring structures. Globalization has become very influential and has been playing out in, in many different ways, but one of the ways is that there are a limited number of big consultancy firms based in Europe, North America, who circulate what I would call northern models across the world as a solution. So that's been very important in globalizing the thinking about transport that emerged in Europe and North America in, in the, um, the, the, the decades after the Second World War. And more recently, this century, we've got the rise of uh, the, the People's Republic of China, which is for a field like transport geography, transformational, because I think nowadays we can really see that the, the center of gravity of knowledge production lies in China. And where it used to be Western Europe and North America, that, that geography has completely shifted. And I think we, we're still in the early stages of this process, and we'll see much more of that coming, uh, going forward. So the knowledge that was originally, that originally emerged in the global north has been traveling around the world. But in so doing has also changed. It's become hybridized. Because I think we need to be very careful to avoid what uh, geographer James Blount has called Western diffusionism, which says is, is a particular understanding of colonial and post-colonial relationships, where the West is always seen as the creator, the, the hotbed of innovation, which then spread around the world, because that is still thinking about the West as leading the way and as sort of at the vanguard of, of development also in science. Whereas what actually happens is that these Western scientific assumptions and practices, when they arrive in non-Western context, they will inevitably need to be linked to existing material infrastructures, knowledge systems, and ethical and moral assumptions and practices by researchers in those places. They need to make sense locally as well. So we see in that traveling also a process of adaptation. If we look at the internal relations, then what we've seen has happened in transport studies is the rise of exemplary ways of conceptualizing and intervening in particular situations that have then inspired further generations of researchers. Now, this focus on exemplary ways of conceptualizing and intervening is a different way of talking about paradigms. The term paradigm, as originally proposed by Thomas Kuhn in his work, The Structure of Scientific Revolutions, which is often in, in, in sort of work drawn, drawing on the uh, studies drawing on the work of Kuhn. Often paradigms get explained as a set of beliefs to which a scientific community subscribes. But it can also be understood much more in a practice way, like, like I'm doing here, following the work of, of a range of uh, theorists, including Joseph Rouse, who says that paradigms are these exemplary ways of conceptualizing and intervening in particular situations. So scientists use paradigms rather than believing them. Accepting a paradigm entails acquiring and using a set of skills instead of understanding and believing in a set of statements. Which means that normal science is not a particular cognitive attitude, 
but a particular way of manipulating and dealing with the world, which is grounded in particular examples uh, from the past. And what transport studies has been extraordinarily good at is creating these kinds of ways of conceptualizing and manipulating the, uh, the materials that we work with. And there are many examples. I just put some here. But actually, in the um, late 1950s, transport geography was really at the core of innovation in geography. It's never, it's never recaptured that situation, but work by William Garrison and others here on the left-hand side about these, these networks was truly groundbreaking in geography. And sort of, the, yeah, you can read the text for yourself. It's a very elementary explanation of what a network is now, but then was sort of really influential, kind of lost its bearings in geography, but if you now talk, look at reviews in, by physicists on network science, you see some of these physicists actually going back to these old sources that in geography are now largely forgotten. But they were incredibly influential, and in some American transport geography texts you can still find them. Perhaps the best example is known as the four-step modeling approach, where you try to predict how transport will look like in the future by sort of thinking about demand, by, uh, by breaking up future demand in four stages, trip generation, trip distribution, model split, and trip assignment. Transport, geography, transport researchers, I should say, have been very, very strong in the development of discrete choice models and the framework, the theoretical framework of random utility maximization, which is brilliant because it's extremely flexible. You can model anything with this. And by the way you manipulate your error terms, you can, you, you can explain almost any, any process. And it's been revolutionary. Of course, these applications are not limited to transport, but some of the earlier work of McFadden was actually on transport, and he got the Nobel Prize in uh, 98 or 2000, one or the other. But uh, it's been widely credited, this work, as being profoundly influential also beyond the, the discipline of transport studies. We've got activity-based travel demand models, we've got the use of uh, GPS data. There are many other things I could have said, I could have placed on this, on this slide. And I've already mentioned the graphs on the left-hand side. On the right-hand side is, in many ways, the Bible of discrete choice modeling, a book with which many generations of researchers have learned to model behavior. Me too, in classes with Patricia Mokhtarian at UC Davis. We worked with this book, and I still, if I need to do a discrete choice model or more, li more likely need to read about it, I regularly still go back to this book because it really contains, it explains all the, the, the basics really, really well. So, very influential way of doing things. And these ways of conceptualizing and manipulating are profoundly based on equipment, on tools. And these tools are more than simply instruments that a user adopts, because these tools also change how that user thinks at multiple levels. It influences how the world is encountered, what gets understood as a problem, and what kinds of solution is being imagined. Which is why I think this term tool being is a really nice way of thinking about what's going on. It's really about the human beings, the human communities, and the, 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 the artifacts, the practices, the rules that they work with. It's sort of, you need to think about all of that. And transport studies has been extraordinarily successful in institutionalizing various ways of, of doing this. Now, this tool being is one leg of what, after Greg Marston and Louise Reardon, I would call the technical rational paradigm 
in transport studies. The other lag is a particular understanding of the science policy interface, premised on the classic separation of fact from value. And the role of the researcher here is supposed to be objective. He or she is, to, is supposed to provide factual results that the people who deal in values, i.e. policy makers and decision makers, can work with. So a strict separation that, that maintains the objectivity of science. I very deliberately put in ways of conceptualizing, and for example, because I think it is really important to appreciate that this technical rational paradigm has multiplicity within it. It's not all of the same, it's not singular. It has some kind of variation already within it. So there is a degree of plurality, of pluralism already embedded in it. But what we've seen over the last 25 years or so is a different scale of pluralization. I, I call that pluralization 2.0, where we've seen the rise of additional paradigms. Now, none of these are as embedded, institutionalized as the, the technical rational paradigm is, but they are sort of all doing something really interesting. We've had work from behavioral psychology that is largely configured around the theory of planned behavior. We've got the new mobilities paradigm. We've got work on transitions, work on practice theory, and most recently, work on critical transport and mobility studies. Now, I'm not going to go through all of these in detail. I just want to show a couple of uh, examples. This is a quite sophisticated model by German psychologists of uh, the purchase of, of more fuel efficient cars. But if you look carefully, if you were to dig into the various boxes, you would see that the basics of the theory of planned behavior are still there. So intention is the crucial variable, which is a function of social norms, of attitudes, and of uh, perceived behavioral control. And all the other variables are bells and whistles that have been added in response to criticism of the original version of the theory of planned behavior. And this is just one of many elaborations of this approach in a transport context. I just wanted to show this one because I think it looks quite nice and, and quite impressive. And uh, the modeling that is used is very, uh, very sophisticated. And uh, I know people in Frank's group have also worked with this kind of approach and, and related approaches and have really shown different dimensions of travel behavior compared to what you get with a discrete choice approach. It's not that one is better than the other. They simply show different bits of reality, I would, show, I would say. Yesterday, I showed both of these uh, in, in, in my slides, in a slightly different constellation, but the book Mobility Justice is one of the key publications that has come out of the new mobilities paradigm. It was only published in 2018, and I think we can now already say it's a classic in the genre, and is being cited and used in, in many different places, and rightfully so, because I think it's a really interesting and inspiring book. And I also showed you the diagram about system change, which comes out of the social technical transitions approach, and, and within that, the transition management uh, uh, approach developed by Derek Lohrbach and, and other Dutch transition scholars. The most recent sibling, you could say, is the critical geographies of transport and mobility. I think you can hardly call this a paradigm. I think it's more a paradigm to be. But it's a very interesting body of work. On the left-hand side is a paper by, led by, by Julie Sidel at uh, um, University of Illinois, which is in many ways the first statement of what a critical geography of transport and mobility might look like. And it's, it's a really nice condensation of quite different range of ideas and activities in this one paper, and I think it's a really useful uh, agenda-setting 
peace. Of course, agenda setting pieces are also partial. They miss out some bits of work, including the work shown on the right hand side. Uh, yesterday I said I would use this series to, to celebrate Belgian scholarship, and this is one of these strands of work that I feel deserves to be celebrated the work of Wojciech Kublowski and co workers around critical urban transport studies. This is, I think, their best cited paper, which was uh, published in 2018. And I think there was a link to the work going on in Ghent at the time, not least because David is, a, is an alumnus of the uh, University of Ghent. So we see this pluralization, which I think is partly linked to the centrality of transport to the issues I began my talk yesterday with. Questions of urbanization, questions of inequality, new technology, and environmental problems, including the climate emergency. But there's also a question of generational change, because these new agendas are driven by new scholars, new generations of scholars, so uh, new generations have led to the emergence of these new, new paradigms. However, and I think this is really important, these new alternative paradigms operate on an uneven playing field, academically and professionally. Academically, what we see is that we see a, a multiplication of new circuits of academic work. And with circuits, I mean journals, conferences, societies, where these various scholars meet and interact with one another, rather than sort of head-on confronting the technical rational paradigm in transport studies. What you see is that, for instance, the new mobilities paradigm has led to the, the rise of an, an array of new interesting journals, but that do often not really communicate that much with what's going on in the more conventional transport field. I think you also see that these newer paradigms have, an, have not as much ability to shape these wider discourses about transport, which is why these ideas about disutility that I started off with continue to be so influential. And partly that is also because these newer paradigms unevenly included in professional circuits with policy makers, industry actors, and, and so on. All of this may change over time and probably will change over time. But if we accept the proposition that all these new alternative approaches or paradigms have something meaningful to add to the thinking and practice regarding just mobility transitions, then we need to accelerate their societal institutionalization. We need to make sure that they too, are, that these voices and ideas are, are sort of are picked up more by policy makers, by industry actors, and, and so on. There are different ways that can be done, but one way would be to invent new modes of tool being, new ways of manipulating the world of, of, of understanding and manipulating the world that we work with. Now, you could argue the social technical transitions paradigm has been doing some of this already, and it has, not least because of the transition management approach that has been, been, been developed by Jan, Jan Rotmans, Derek Lorbach, and others at, at uh, the Erasmus University of uh, Rotterdam. But there's much more space and opportunity for experimentation and action in this regard. And whatever action is taken, it will be essential to not limit initiatives simply to the level of making more academic, generating more academic knowledge and producing papers that are published in academic journals. We need to do more. We really need to invent new modes of tool being. Which 
brings me to the question of valuation, which can be defined as the assigning of value of values to particular object, objects. It seems to me that we need to rethink and rework notions of value and practices of valuation if we want to achieve just transformations in mobility and thereby move beyond the quite tiresome notion of travel time as a disutility to be minimized by the acceleration of movement. And here, there's an interesting link that can be made with a new interdisciplinary field, the field of valuation studies. Very novel, uh, very social science focused. There's also a, the, there's a journal, the Journal of Valuation Studies, uh, which is an open access journal, uh, which brings together a very heterogeneous, diversified body of research. In, and within that panoply of ideas and practices and, uh, and, and impulses, I think the work of French sociologist Nathalie Heinich is really interesting. She wrote this book, uh, De Valeur, that was published some time ago in French, uh, is yet to be translated and published in English, but she's, there's a couple of papers now that have been published that summarize the, the, the ideas of the French work in, in English. And I think that work is really helpful because this self-reflexive perspective on valuation as uh, yeah, the assigning of values and qualities to an object is very helpful because it can help us to understand how we evaluate in transport research and how we can value transport related interventions. Because the traditional way of valuing things in transport is still very much based on cost benefit analysis. You basically try to imagine all the things that have changed that will change as a result of an, of an intervention that you want to make. For instance, you want to create, a new, you want to build a new road. You look at all the changes that that will, um, that will bring, desired or undesired. You put a monetary value onto that, and then you kind of look at what the, the ratio is of, of the costs and the benefits. It's a very powerful and useful technique. And I think the slide says some strengths. I would say it has many strengths. Um, and it can allow decision makers to uh, get a very clear understanding of what, different, what the consequences will be of different options that they can choose from. But there are many weaknesses. And there's now an extensive literature that has talked about the limitations of CBA in the transport context. I think, for me, one of the most difficult things is that it requires you to quantify and monetize consequences. And, and that means, for instance, that you will have to put a monetary value on lives lost, lives saved. There's a huge debate about how to do that. There is a consensus approach. But you can wonder, can I express the value of a, of a human life in, in a monetary value? I think that's a deeply philosophical and also ideological question that different people will have different responses to. On a more practical level, what this kind of approach tends to do is that most of the benefits of transport schemes stem from the way in which they allow travel time to be saved. Uh, David Bannister and Robin Hickman, uh, when they were both at the Transport Studies Unit in, in Oxford, have sort of shown that there are schemes where up to 90% of all the benefits stem from travel time savings. So it's, it's a really powerful element in this. There's also a, quite a bit of work that has shown that CBA struggles to consider questions of distributive justice. Bertrand Rey at the University of Delft, the Technical University of Delft, has, uh, has shown this extensively in his work. He and colleagues have, have tried to develop ways of bringing distributive justice into this form of, of evaluation. 
to some extent, to some success, I would say, but some elements are still quite difficult to, to take on board. And if we think about justice as more than distribution, also think about procedural justice and justice as recognition, I think that's really difficult to incorporate in these kinds of tools. So, significant disadvantages, which is why quite a few researchers have been experimenting with multi-criteria analysis as an alternative way of valuing different options in transport studies. Really interesting work has been done in, in this field, not least at the University of Antwerp, where uh, Kathy Makaris has for years been developing participatory approaches to multi-criteria analysis, and, and to great effect. I think there's some really interesting insights that have come out of that work. And more recently, they've moved to a new set of ways of, of uh, valuing different options. And the paper on the right-hand side is, on the right hand side has been published less than two weeks ago. And uh, what they do here is provide an alternative to multi-criteria analysis that re relaxes some of the assumptions that underpin most uh, procedures, uh, most, most um, multi-criteria analysis uh, frameworks. So there is no longer the assumption that, that things can compensate one another. For instance, it's an interesting approach again, but yeah, still depends on, on questions of, of ranking uh, in, in some shape or form. So, whilst a lot of work is going on in this space of valuing transport interventions, I think we can push this much further. And we can do so by drawing on completely different philosophical, theoretical resources than we usually consider in transport. Um, I think there are many ways in which you can do that. Um, I've been thinking quite a lot over the last year with the, uh, the help of the, the two books the two, and the two authors that you see here on the screen. On the left-hand side, Brian Masumi, a post-structuralist philosopher based in the States, who's written a manifesto a post-capitalist a post manifesto in, that consists of 99 theses for the revaluation of value, which really tries to establish a post-monetary, post-capitalist understanding of value, and does so outside of the Marxist tradition, because if you don't want to go down the CBA, MCA route, often the Marxist tradition is, is your, your route of choice, and there is very interesting work going on in this space. But this is creating something that sits also outside of that framework. And I believe this is quite interesting. Um, and it draws on some of the ideas that, that White had developed in the 1930s in his work on value. And White had is an unusual philosopher in many different ways, but not least because he was very explicitly concerned with getting rid of the distinction between fact and value, where the world, as we study it, nature is consisting of facts and values are things that are held by humans. It's values are in the eye of the beholder. His thesis is values are in the world. They exist outside uh, human perception of and, and thinking about that world. And these values are plural, irreducibly so. They are heterogeneous because each element in nature is a unique bit of value. But that doesn't mean that all these values are completely independent of one another because the, 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 the scheme that White had developed is very much about values as both individual and collective. And I think that's a really interesting way of thinking about this. And he also understands values as adding qualities at the collective level. And he uses some common day terms, reasonably common, uh, common sense terms, to denote something completely different. So when he talks about beauty, it's not the kind of beauty, the idea that we have when we think about beauty. So beauty does not refer 
to the aesthetic experience of the human subject in the way that you can, for instance, say that a piece of art is beautiful or a, or a flower is beautiful. Beauty is not in the eye of the beholder, but in the world as such. And it has two elements. It's on the one hand about the diversity of ingredients that are being combined, and on the other hand is about the intensity with which these elements are felt. And harmony is essential here because it increases value intensity, which is at the heart of some of the things that Whitehead tries to do. So he sees upholding value intensity as critical to existence and suggests that we have no right to deface the value experience, which is the very essence of the universe. Now, Whitehead's texts are very abstract, and just a little bit of explanation I give may well get your head spinning, but I think it is actually quite helpful. It provides some really interesting ideas for thinking about value in a completely different way than we're used to. My contention is that a Whiteheadian understanding of value offers an opportunity to place justice, as I defined it yesterday, at the heart of valuation in a transport context. Now, this is far from straightforward, and there's still a lot of work that I need to do, both conceptually and certainly also in terms of developing ways of then operationalizing that in a research context. But this is something I've been recently uh, uh, doing some work on. And just one simple example of where this might lead. Think about walking or cycling, which in many ways it adds value because it offers you more direct exposure to the world than you get behind a windscreen in a car. So there's potentially a greater diversity and intensity of embodied experience when you walk and cycle, or walk or cycle. And this is where harmony is important, because if that intensity of experience is harmonious, it may actually be very valuable. Conversely, it means if we start to think about changing the environments in which cycling and walking takes place, is that you try to intervene in such a way that you reduce conflicts and harness contrasts. So you try to actively focus on reducing conflicts with other road users, not least these big SUVs that you have to deal with cycling in a city like Oxford. It also is about reducing conflicts with, in particular, climatic conditions. So cycling is not necessarily everywhere always generating harmony. So cannot be a blanket approach to uh, thinking about intervening in transport in, in different parts of the world and in different situations. Kind of goes back to what I talked about in the previous hour. And we can also think in this example about value for others and for the whole. Because cycling and walking as an activity and the infrastructures that they require are much less of an imprint and a drain on the ability of others to achieve value, intensity, or beauty. Not least because walking and cycling are much less resource intensive when you consider propulsion equipment and infrastructures. So this is where a link can be made to these capabilities that are linked in the way that I talked about the previous hours. So this is where questions of distributive justice start to come in. What I've just tried to explain with regard to cycling and walking is still quite abstract, but necessarily so because we know that cycling and walking are very differentiated activities. There are, these are very differentiated modalities and experiences of, of movement. And this is also where a link can be made to recognition justice. Now, that's something I will need to work through more fully, but I hope you begin to see that there are ways in which different aspects of justice can be folded into how we think about the valuation of cycling and walking. 
And I think what this can lead to ultimately is that we, we end up with a different hierarchy of desirability with what we should prioritize and, and what we should focus on. And it will do so in a way that recognizes that any hierarchy will necessarily be situated and provisional, and that context is really at the heart of all of this. What this means is that the idea of travel time gains as being the main component of value can potentially be eclipsed. Because travel time is here not seen as a disutility, but can be recognized as potentially full of events and intensity, and as something that has ramifications for others and indeed the wider world, including Gaia, to use Isabel Stenger's term. Now, obviously all of this is very abstract, very theoretical, and a far cry from the development of practical tools for appraisal, but I do believe that some of these tools can be developed. And actually, Masumi's book offers some really interesting ideas about how I can sort of uh, push this forward. So this is, some of the, this, this is one of my new pet projects that I will be working on in, in the coming, in the coming uh, years. So perhaps in a future lecture somewhere, I'll be able to talk more um, in, sort of in a more empirical sense about this. For now, again, let me conclude with three takeaway messages. I think I'll, do this, I'll try to do this with all of the lectures so that we get a, a nice list of points that we can, uh, we can try to distill some of the insights uh, that are emerging from this, from, from this series. Um, first message is there is a history to transport knowledge that is very much tied to the events and processes that I discussed. Um, and that really needs to be seen in the wider context of what has happened in the 20th and uh, 21st century. There are multiple approaches to knowing transport and mobility at the current juncture, but there is no level playing field for them. And I think it is really important to work towards further pluralization of transport knowledge, and this should not only be focused on the level of ideas and nice scientific publications that are good for individual scholars' careers. They should also result in tools that will support just transformations in mobility. I realize that's a long, there's, some, there's still quite some time to go before we are there, but I think it's, it's something that is worthwhile working towards. Thank you very much. Questions? The trick is to stay clear from monetary values, not because monetary values are inherently bad. I just think we need other ways to compare things and to find ways of, of thinking about value. Whether they can then also be taken up by practitioners, by professionals, I think is a different question and it's a really challenging question. So one of the things that I want to do is sort of, from a very early stage onwards in this new work, sort of shift towards co-production with stakeholders. So actually, with small projects, work with stakeholders to develop things that also make sense to them. So that sort of, my input is perhaps more on the, on the theoretical side and, and sort of they can bring their more practical side to it, because I'm not that kind of person who can do that. Yeah. yeah. And I think it is also important to not just work with the stakeholders we tend to work with, the, 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 the elite, so to speak, the, 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 
policy makers and, and the people in industry, but also with communities who live in cities. Um, so I think it'd be really interesting to do some of this work with, with older adults uh, who have various health issues or various uh, um, concerns that are not usually taken into account. Think about people with a disability. Um, yeah, I think there's, there's loads of ways in which this can be taken forward. I think that too is open for discussion. I think it depends on what you, what various potential users would want and need. But I think you can, you can think about ways of using numbers that you kind of shift them from the very quantitative and, and sort of you find a middle ground between the quantitative and the qualitative, if that makes sense. That's kind of where I, I think I want to end up. Theoretical and abstract, but I think worthwhile and important. And I think particularly if we think about infrastructures for walking and cycling, this is quite important because it's actually, if, if, if you do the, the CBA tricks, yeah, you get monetary values, but the benefits are actually not that great for these kinds of schemes. The CBA works better the more you're able to speed it, to, to accelerate things, because then you're, these travel time benefits sort of really start to kick in. So think about smaller schemes in the first instance, and also think about infrastructure in a slightly different way than we used to, because infrastructure is often very much, you put a track there and that's it. But you don't think then about how that infrastructure gets lift, which is something I'll be talking about in the next lecture. I want to talk about infrastructures and, and, and cities and uh, urban form, not simply in the way that we usually do, through sort of the, the, the three Ds or the five Ds or the seven Ds, or I think we, we got 10 now, of design diversity and uh, density. Um, but in a much more way that's sort of aligned with how these infrastructures are being experienced, and particularly for walkability, that is really important. Yeah, we've done some work in this space, and colleagues have done work in this space. So I think for those kinds of ways, this, this more dynamic way of thinking about value can, can, can really add some new insight. Thank you for your attention and your questions, and hope to see you again in February. Uh, sorry, March. Yeah, it's already yeah, 16 and 17th. Yeah. You can use those sources, but uh, I think there is, a, there is at least two other categories of source that you can use. There's a lot of work, particularly in this new mobilities paradigm, with using innovative qualitative methods for capturing transport experiences and transport behaviors. So I think that you can get a lot from that, working with video ethnography, working with diaries, um, many different things you can do. So that's a very valuable source. And the other is that we see so many sensors migrating into urban environments that we get a lot of new data coming forward. If you look at um, what's happening, at least, in, at least in the UK, I presume it's the same in Belgium, but street furniture is a really hot topic now. With the Internet of Things, you see that the humble lamppost as we know it, is, is going to change into a, a, a sort of a hub of sensors 
where you monitor air pollution, you have cameras that sort of monitor parking, vandalism, all sorts of things get measured and sensed with different sensors. Some of that data will end up in the, pri in, in the private domain, will be sort of collected by private companies, big IT companies, who will not make that data available. But because it's the public domain, there will also be a strong push for that data to become public and can be used in new ways. And I think if you add all that data together and if you combine that with other sources of data, you can create really new insights. Not least because we've never been able to sort of monitor things over sort of different time cycles. Sort of think about the, the time cycle of a day, the diurnal cycle. There's so much that happens in an urban environment that we simply have never been able to measure. I think we'll see that this kind of data offers a whole new source of information that can be used in different ways. So, new data, different methods, but also creativity. I think that's really important. That's why I think it is so important for students like yourself to be really trained in an interdisciplinary manner, sort of have a, a background in data science and in the humanities to be able to sort of really bring those fields together and, and think in new creative ways about what can be done with the new data that are emerging. So I hope that this is an area that you or your colleagues will be working in. Good. Thank you. And